the preclinical and the clinical and preclinical evidence for effectiveness against again temporal ordering. Preclinical comes after clinical, so we start with clinical. Uh, the published evidence includes uh, 33 treatments for opioid dependence, a complete resolution of withdrawal signs in 88 percent of the individuals. Uh, this is data that um, I published with Howard and uh, the senior author, Jan Bastians, uh, who was a uh, famous Dutch psychiatrist that was involved in early treatments in the Netherlands. Another open-label perspective study uh, done in St. Kitts. Uh, and then three treatments, one for opioid dependence, uh, another couple of case studies, and that's what you've got in the peer-reviewed uh, literature. Um, this is very important data. This is the data that was presented to the National Institute on Drug Abuse uh, and that initiated uh, NIDA's uh, Ibogaine um, uh, project. National Institute of Drug Abuse is one of the national institutes of health uh, and the National Institutes of Health um, is where most research expenditures originate from, most uh, uh, support of uh, academic teaching centers. So you have, uh, in terms of uh, outcomes, um, and these were determined by interview, 29% um, uh, abstinent at two months, uh, basically um, about 30% uh, 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 of the sample abstinent beyond six months. It's an interesting tr uh, treatment effect. This treatment effect <clears throat> is approximately the size of the treatment effect that one sees in, with six months in a therapeutic community. So NIDA's Ibogaine Project, again, NIDA is the National Institute of Drug Abuse, on Drug Abuse, um, created by Richard Nixon, by the way. Um, uh, NIDA uh, is uh, one of the National Institutes of Health, and they undertook an Ibogaine project uh, between 1991 and 1996, and this was disappointing in some sense, but highly productive in a scientific sense. Um, the case series of treatments uh, that I uh, referenced in the previous slide uh, was uh, the evidence that basically supported this project, uh, that uh, basically stimulated the initiation of this project. NIDA expended approximately $2 million U.S. dollars, uh, $2 million in, in early 1990s direct costs. Uh, the principal accomplishments were important. Uh, they included preclinical toxicology, proof of concept research, chemical manufacturing control, CMC work. Chemical manufacturing control work is basically, you know, we think of clinical trials as clinical trials in which humans receive uh, medications and we focus on that part of the process. But the most time consuming, the, time, you know, the, the limiting uh, aspect of the whole drug discovery process, the whole drug development process, is very frequently the chemical and manufacturing control process where it is proven that you have a substance that is pure and is stable uh, and uh, it can be given to human beings. And this precedes uh, the work uh, on humans and, and uh, precedes phase one uh, where uh, humans begin to receive uh, Ibogaine. Uh, the National Institute of Drug Abuse developed its own protocol um, and NIDA supported intramural and extramural preclinical phase one research that led the Fed Food and Drug Administration to approve a phase one dose escalation study in which human subjects did receive Ibogaine. Um, unfortunately, that study terminated prematurely, probably at the point where people had received only two milligrams per kilogram, but it was for the indication of stimulant dependence. And basically, um, at that dose, uh, there may have been a treatment effect or going a little higher uh, in terms of the interest now in lower doses to treat stimulant dependence. Uh, but this is uh, you know, one of the uh, great disappointments in terms of the uh, uneven uh, and uh, uh, hope, uh, hope, uh, and uh, you know, hope escalations and uh, crashing disappointments uh, that's characterized Ibogaine's development uh, to this point. Uh, in March of 1995, a panel that included outside consultants from the pharmaceutical industry voted not to fund. A new leader came and a new head came into NIDA. The protocol had been created. He couldn't uncreate it, so what he did is he called in an outside committee uh, who basically said, don't fund the project. And that was that. Um, another domain of evidence is the people who have taken Ibogaine. 
uh, medical ethnography, interviewing, uh, structured interviewing, in-depth interviewing of people who have taken Ibogaine. The results of this medical ethno ethnographic um, uh, methodology indicate consistency among reports of treatment experiences and outcomes. Uh, the strongest attribution of efficacy is for the indication of a detoxification. Um, people report a variable uh, uh, interval of reduced drug craving following treatment, and often on the order of weeks to months. Uh, the reports of individuals who have taken Ibogaine may have mechanistic significance uh, in terms of the functional effects that I referenced earlier, such as descriptions of panoramic memory, this density of, uh, of uh, autobiographical images uh, that is recalled on Ibogaine sometimes, and the oniric or dreamlike state. Uh, Oniris is a Greek root word um, uh, that indicates dreaming. Um, so we studied, a, did a quantitative study, uh, Howard Lotsoff uh, and uh, Charles Kaplan, a sociologist who had studied the use of Ibogaine in the Netherlands, and we had sort of a quantitative snapshot of the Ibogaine, uh, use of Ibogaine as of February of 2006. So we looked at the interval between 2001 and 2006, and at that point in time, uh, there was an estimated total of 4,300 to 4,900 treatments. Um, that's the size of a population, of a, of a, a significant uh, population that would be used uh, in a phase three trial. You know, for example, the phase three trials of antidepressants commonly uh, have included this uh, kind of number of individuals. 68%, um, two thirds of them took it for substance related disorders and 53% of the total sample took it for opioid detoxification. Uh, this has been referred to as the great uncontrolled experiment, uh, the, um, the phase three trial that is taking place in the field, um, and uh, its results uh, are uh, basically have been assessed so far by medical ethnography and a few uh, case series. Uh, the growth of the Ibogaine subculture during the first half of the last decade um, was basically 20 to 30 percent per year. Um, now, it's probably not continuing at that rate. You can't sustain a rate of growth like that forever, uh, but it is probably the case that the number of treatments may have doubled by now. Um, I would say that 2006 is probably the last time we could have done such a study because there's been a proliferation of Ibogaine treatment um, uh, settings uh, since then that has made them much more difficult to track. Uh, so I'm glad we did the paper when we 